Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe this is, look, he's still in the throes of that divorce. Right. He's like, set that uh, on fire. <laughs> I was quoting George Lucas. Right. Man, calm down. Sure No, nothing yes, more. That, right, that's fine. good. Hey, no, welcome that back was to good. another episode of 1980s <laughs> Now, a weekly examination of the importance of 1980s pop culture and its influence today. My name is Will, and joining me, as always, are my friends and co-hosts, John and Kat. <laughs> I got so stumbled there. <laughs> so I, just, I just realized I wasn't recording, so I just pushed record. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. You don't have to well, record. You're my I, part. I hadn't said anything yet, though, so it's okay. Oh, damn it, I lost all your brilliance. Right, let's go back to the cat thing when we're making fun of her. Um, can, can, can we make fun of cat I stumbled again? on your name because I was thinking in my head, you know, I was, I was watching that video where we did the pickle thing last week. Was yeah. it, <laughs> look, that was just part of the whole show. We didn't just get on here to just do a pickle thing. It wasn't just pickles. Um, but I was like, wow, I really don't seem happy or smile at all. So I was just like in my head, smile. And then I was like, who's my, who are the names of these people? Who are they? <laughs> Who am I looking at? That I'm smiling at. Anyway. <laughs> he threw me off because you said John's name first. Yes. Let me try that again. Cat yeah. and John. There you go. Hey, guys. <laughs> Hi, guys. And it's okay Hello. if you say John's name first. That's okay. Mm -mm. No, it's not. <laughs> mm -mm. Not? We go in order. It breaks the rules. Yeah. Uh, we go in order. It's, sequence. it's based on seniority. Exactly. <laughs> hey, and don't forget, uh, John also, in addition to co-hosting here, hosts his very own podcast, Gen X Grown Up. And he makes lots yeah. and lots Indeed. of reels. Thank you. And lots of reels. Don't miss them. I'm always <laughs> cognizant of that when I send emails to people, you know, like I'm sending a lot of them, you know, at work. Mm -hmm. It's like, what's the hierarchy? I got to make sure to put in the right. corner the person who thinks they're the big, biggest, you know. No. Actually, <laughs> I, I usually mix things like that up because I want the the least important person to feel important. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so sometimes yeah. I put them oh. first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that what Kat tries to make me feel important? That's oh. why she... <laughs> Mm. That's why she said I can say your name first. Yeah. She's always saying nice things. She's complimenting me. Yes. Got to keep the monkey happy. Now I realize she knows how important I am because I don't hear anything from her ever, except when she's complaining that I want to hear myself talk. So what? That That's what I heard. It wasn't a complaint. It was more, it was more of an observation. Really. Observation. Okay. Hey, yeah. on today's show, we're not just going to be picking on Kat. Or me or and John or whoever's getting picked on from moment to moment. We're also going to be talking about the insane Indiana Jones scripts that never were and never and should never. have been. Mm, mostly. <laughs> Amen. Mostly. Before we uh, t talk about Indiana Jones, though, we're going to review current news stories related to 1980s media, including... Now, this is a mix, I realize, of stuff that you know exactly what I'm talking about and stuff that's maybe a little more ambiguous. Whatever. Mm. Hey, Tom Cruise is no longer satisfied with just trying to kill himself on screen. Uh, Quantum Leap has been renewed. See, that's pretty straightforward. Oh, right? shit. The Beastie Boys get a museum exhibit. <laughs> and Indy praises short round. Ah. All right, there you go. Hey, and there's time codes in the show notes if you'd like to skip around. All right. I didn't know that last one. Yeah, I just added it. Okay. So it just came out, and I thought... Pretty sneaky. It's just small. It went down thing, to 55%. So 55% prepared. Mm. <laughs> the preparedness is taking a dip. <laughs> well, let's get, let's challenge that and get caught up on 1980s news. We'll challenge the preparedness. All right. Okay. Hey, and this week in 1980s news, per deadline, a Top Gun Maverick duo, Joseph Kaczynski, the director, and Jerry Bruckheimer, the producer, uh, spoke about the physical toll of the aerial stunts and the possibility of another sequel. Mm -hmm. If you guys have seen any Tom Cruise movie, I want to say, what was the first one where he tried to murder himself? Uh, not the first <laughs> Mission Impossible, because there was some green screen in that. Probably by the second one. Remember when he's hanging mm -hmm. on the cliff with his fingers? Mm -hmm. I don't think he even has wires on him. There's that helicopter mm -hmm. shot. It's all real. Yeah, yeah. It might be that. So what are we saying, like 20 years? So if you've seen any Tom Cruise movie uh, in the last 20 years, you had the possibility of also seeing a Faces of Death movie. Because this dude, more and more, is just straight up trying to do stuff that may end his life. He you know, seems to have right. a great life, too. What's that? Because it would go straight to the screen. They would edit that out. You'd certainly get to see yeah. it. Right? Uh, I feel like he could have hurt himself sliding across the floor in socks. Isn't huh. that something <laughs> Risky that business. we're warned against as children? <laughs> ooh, 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 so hot. <laughs> he could fall down. Oh, fall he down. He falling down on that. There's got to be an slide. outtake where he fell down. I think so. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Maybe, maybe as long ago as that, but certainly, mm. you know, 
But um, mm-hmm. so, okay. So, of course, in, in Top Gun Maverick, the film that came out uh, earlier this year, that was, you know, it was just an instant success. I think mm-hmm. not only riding on a wave of nostalgia, mm-hmm. but it was just a good movie. It was, it was a good movie. Yeah. It yeah. was, absolutely. And part of it were these awe-inspiring aerial stunts that are seen mm-hmm. in the film. That mm-hmm. Now, maybe people are cynical when they go to these theater nowadays. I know I'm cynical just generally, but you probably <laughs> saw it and thought, holy <laughs> shit, I think they're really flying this, but they can't be, right? They really can't be. Well, they were. Right. They were. That's, All these actors hmm. were really in these jets. They weren't Amazing. flying them themselves. They actually had, you know, Top Gun actual pilots flying these jets with mm-hmm. the sure. actors in the, you know, different mm-hmm. what, a different part of the cockpit. Mm-hmm. But that didn't matter to Tom Cruise. They still had, he still put <laughs> his cast through training that would have them have the ability to do these things all on their own. So mm-hmm. uh, speaking at Deadline's Contenders, LA3C panel, uh, the director and producer that I just mentioned, uh, Krasinski and Bruckheimer, detailed the physical limits to which each actor was willing to push themselves in order to bring the picture to life mm-hmm. and the length that Cruz was willing to go in order to make it happen. <laughs> it seems easier for him though. Cause he's fucking nuts. I mean, <laughs> yes. these people who are like, I don't know. Well, right. look, I'll tell you what it is. You, you told me how far you would go. We know John would do anything for money, but yeah, if <laughs> we do, we establish that. Time. No, not anything. <laughs> there are limits. I just haven't found them yet. Huh? Is there a no can do? Okay. Oh, ow, 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 ow. Oh, good. That's back. But I don't know that I would be this willing to be in a Tom Cruise movie. All right. So this is what happened. So he Cruise devised a three month course for the actors that had them start with a very simple airplane and work their way up to flying Navy jets. Ultimately, they were able to do all their scenes in the jets for real, including maneuvers more intense than those they did in training. And these, again, these were guys that were flying with actual Top Gun pilots when they were doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the training didn't just include aerial stunts. It also included water survival. I guess in case they went down, but I think they were filming entirely over land. So Uh. maybe this was just how to... They don't explain it. Maybe it's just how to deal with a pressure situation, you know? That's because, what I was thinking, mm, yeah, me right. dealing with a stressful, uh, quick thinking yeah. situation. Yeah. The only thing I can yeah. think when I think of the water survival is I can only think of Goose and Top Gun 1. Oh. I'm like, oh, <gasps> yes. Yeah. You know, mm. the, because they bailed out over water and the, that, that yeah. scene leaves to my, we're talking yeah. Top Gun, we're yeah. talking water survival, like, oh, that crushing scene. So, yeah. So I got to that part of the article and I had to stop and cry and then it could continue. <laughs> So maybe Tom Cruise was emotionally affected by this fictional thing he went through. Maybe. Maybe. But this sounds, this is just crazy. Uh, Bruckheimer said they put the actors into a cage blindfolded, dumped them in the water about six or eight feet down and turned them upside down. Like, okay, that's bad enough already. (laughs) But then he explains that they had to figure out how to get out of the cage. Yeah. What the Uh. I, I'm I only blindfolded and underwater and upside down and disoriented and yeah. drowning. No problem. I'm going to be fine. I, yeah. I think I'd rather do aerial stunts than that. Right? <laughs> oh, <sighs> yeah. Because yeah. then if you need some air, you just got to pop that thing open. <laughs> <laughs> you got some air. All right. <laughs> now, I, I think I would be out. Honestly, look, I, I like, <clears throat> I like going in the water. I don't have no problem with going underwater. Mm-hmm. blindfolded underwater mm-hmm. upside down I, that's it i'm out already i think but then the right. cage and you know they when they do these when they film stuff underwater in movies that require a lot of underwater stuff they have a scuba divers around they have diving right. bells they have all these yeah, things yeah. ready to make sure that no one's going to be yeah uh, hurt but how, yeah. what do they account for if someone's in a cage upside down and blindfolded <laughs> This is, even, the, count. even the guy's like, who has the key? What's the what's the hand gesture for who has the goddamn key? <laughs> it sounds like whoever set up this training was like a wrestling promoter. Like all the crazy things. Cage match. Yes. They're going to be bolted together. The lights will be out. <laughs> There'll be a whip at the top yeah. of a post. <laughs> it's like how much crazy cup you pour yeah. these four Finally, guys. they climb out to the side of the pool and someone gives them a suplex. <laughs> <laughs> You're in. It's a chair match for the title. Surprisingly, <laughs> according to Bruckheimer, only one actor didn't get sick during training or filming. Right. Mm-hmm. Monica Barbaro. Get him, girl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He said, quote, the female is the strongest of all. 
Yeah. Now, look, of course, these guys are in a panel. They're talking about the success of Top Gun 3. So fans are wondering if we can expect another film in the near future. So when asked, the Kaczynski said it will come down to finding a story that needs to be told. But hmm. he said, quote, it seems to me at the end of this film that Maverick has some gas left in the tank. He's not settling down, end quote. And I will add, he's also still alive. So that motherfucker <laughs> is going to keep on doing these movies till he's dead. He's got that going for him. <laughs> and I, you know, it's going to be Top Gun in space. They're going to have to do some uh, crazy <laughs> actual scenes in space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Something's going to go horribly wrong finally. This guy's definitely going to die in a movie. I, I, I predict. What a way to go, though. I hope not. But That's not cynical at all. Yeah, I got to yeah. say, just recently having been in a, gone for a ride in a very small airplane. A yeah. Cessna. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because my brother has his. Oh, right. Yes. License. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I, that was enough. I can't yeah. imagine doing more or faster or upside down or <laughs> out. Yeah. Yeah. Kat was like, I can't handle 1.05 G's. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't throw up, but I don't want any more. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I was in a little plane like that too with somebody I knew mm-hmm. who just started flying and you know, they have the mm-hmm. two yokes, right? And he's, yes. He was like, Hey, yes. do you want to fly? I was like, Sure. So I put my hand on the yoke. I kept that thing as still as possible. <laughs> yes. So my time was over. It was like, you can turn, you can go down. Don't worry about it. I can handle anything that happens. I was like, all right, I'll just do this. Still. <laughs> I had that opportunity as well. Yeah. Twice. And the first time <laughs> I moved it a little bit and my brother's like, oh, not that far. <laughs> and then he took over. <laughs> right. Exactly. What is this flashing red light? Any friend that would allow me to go up in a plane, they would 100%, no matter what I did, they'd yeah. say, do whatever you want. And anything I do, they go, not that. It immediately <laughs> scare the hell out of me. And I have to soil myself right. and go in the back and change. And John, hits, <laughs> John hits the eject button and immediately gets out. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but you said, I was kidding. <laughs> and that's where your water oh, survival yeah. comes in. You have those friends too. You know how they are. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, another 1980s news per variety, Quantum Leap, uh, the, se- the series that, uh, look, it's one of our favorites right now, one of the new series that Yay. we're really enjoying. It's been yes. renewed for season two, and it even hasn't yes. even <laughs> finished season one. I mean, that's kind of unheard of these days, right. I think, where more and more shows seem to be getting canceled. Right. Mm-hmm. So for folks who don't recall, and we've talked about it a few times at this point, but the, yep. the new version of the show p- picks up 30 years after the events of the original series. It's not a reboot. It's a sequel. Yeah. You know, the soft yeah, reboot is. sequel. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Unlike the first one, which followed uh, Scott Bakula's physicist who travels through time, this one follows Dr. Ben Song, played by Raymond Lee, who's been mm-hmm. hired to restart the project uh, that began in 1989. But mm-hmm. much like Bakula, Song makes an unexpected leap uh, into the past while his team struggles to get him back. A little different mm-hmm. take on this one, whereas they don't know why he left or what he's up to right. uh, in the mm-hmm. new version. Everything else is kind of the same. He's still trying to put right what went what wrong. Went right what once was wrong. Wait, put right <laughs> what once went wrong. <laughs> no, so there it doesn't go. go wrong again. <laughs> and it, yeah, Right? He has to fix what and He touches went blue wrong. and he makes it true. Yes. <laughs> uh, Lisa Katz, the president of scripted content for NBC Universal Television and Streaming, said, quote, as we continue to bring audiences to our must-watch dramas, it's gratifying to know Quantum Leap will have a prominent place next season, both on our NBC schedule and next day on Peacock. Well, I just realized she said that only as an advertisement. Ah. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, look, we take her at her word. It's again, it's kind of surprising that um, mm-hmm. Quantum Leap seems like it's becoming a, I don't know, what would you say? Like a, it's not a linchpin, but it's, it seems important to the network as well. You know, I think their battle cry should be not canceled. <laughs> not canceled. <laughs> so many of my favorite sweetheart shows get canceled right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, the, I'll be the first to admit that this Quantum Leap continuation, not a reboot, as you said, is. Mm-hmm. It's a little, it's a little saccharine. It's a yes, little formulaic, sure. mm-hmm. which is fine. It's, it's, you know, it's not bleeding edge uh, Fargo level drama or anything, <laughs> yeah. but it's fun. Yeah. That's the thing. It's fun. Yeah. And they were starting to weave this interesting story that realistically they thought they only had what, 12 episodes or so. And then they mm-hmm. extended that to 18 and mm-hmm. now they get a whole, whole second season. So, I mean, anybody who is a fan of good storytelling and just fun kind of time travel-y stuff. I, this, is, this is fantastic news. That kind of sci-fi stuff on major networks gets the can right away so often. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and the, the saccharine and formulaic aspect that you point out, uh, you point out about it, 
is what, one of the things that appeals to me because that is so like, you know, mm -hmm. such the epitome of the eighties shows that we liked, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's easy to get into easy to get yeah. out of, right? It's mm -hmm. not going to weigh on you. It's just fun. It's like, Oh, little stories that would never happen. That's okay. Who cares? It was just fun. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And even yep, some yep. disregard for the logic of their own shows. Yes. That's a very kind of, <laughs> yeah, whatever older <laughs> show type thing. Yeah. Uh, per NBC. Still, yeah. Mark my words, mark my words. Scott Bakula will be in oh, this eventually. Okay. All right. Yes. This is I what I'm wondering. So. I just want to, there, there has been some back and forth and I know I'm just saying we, we got Spider-Man to pretty hard. So Bakula and forth. Now, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying he's in already and he's been keeping a big secret, but yeah. especially mm -hmm. got to get renewal. They're going to, I mean, they have way more firepower to come up Bakula now because now they're mm -hmm. a much more popular show. It's going to uh -huh. happen. Mm -hmm. I had read recently, um, and I don't, I'm trying to remember if this was attributed to a quote of his, I certainly don't want to start any rumors, but the idea was that one of the <laughs> certainly not <laughs> one of his one of the reasons Bakula wasn't interested was because originally the, the way it was pitched to him was that it was going to be him and Dean Stockwell just continuing the story, mm. and then he started saying no, we're shifting the focus to having these new characters mm -hmm. take over, and you'll be in it. But you know, mm -hmm. then he was less interested. Okay, um, but I agree with John. He's the, the, certainly more to entice him. And now that you mm -hmm. point out, John, the season got extended. They have these six mm -hmm. other episodes they need to do something with. Is yeah. it possible we see him at the last episode tagging it, you know, into the second season? Mm -hmm. Or he's not in it, be but they get a little ping that, oh, or, that's, that's, we found Beckett. You right. Know? That'd be <laughs> a hell of a cliffhanger, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, per NBC, the series pilot uh, reached a 2.0 rating in eight, in adults 18 to 49 and 10.8 million viewers across all platforms since it originally aired on September 19th. Nice. Yeah, and I was thinking like, what is this? I, I never really get how the Nielsen's ratings work. Now, 10 million sounds like a lot of people um, in this in this sort of market where you've got so many choices, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think some of them probably can't even be tracked. Like you, we don't know how many people are choosing YouTube over, you know, right. so when you talk mm -hmm. about a share, I mean, I, I right. And how many people are watching it and they're watching YouTube on their phone at the same time. They're <laughs> yes. it. Is, that a, is that a half point? How does that, we like nobody and, knows. And getting their masters from the university of Phoenix too, at the same <laughs> time. So in, in a separate tab. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, what was that professor? Um, yeah, so I did pull uh, ratings though for the for the November seventh week, which is the last week Quantum Leap aired. Um, in uh, according to this, just looking at some comparable shows, if I understand this correctly, um, so Quantum Leap again had a two share. Well, this week it said it had it looked like if I understand this correctly, it had a two point five uh, share of viewers that, that uh, week. I'm trying to pull something comparable. Bachelor in Paradise had a similar number. I'm kind of shocked at that. Uh, Voice had double. Uh, at f mm. over five, mm -hmm. but yeah, it seems like, you know, again, it can, I don't know. It seems like even being similar to the bachelors probably puts them in a really great position. Yeah. So and I worked in television for a long time and right. I'm still not a hundred percent on how those work. It has to do with <laughs> of the people watching TV, right. what percentage of those people. And right. Yeah, so. Right. Right. Either way, it's enough that NBC said giddy up. So we get more quantum leap. Yeah. Well, we know we're not the only ones watching it. Apparently not. <laughs> yes. Three, of us. Three out of 10 million. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and while we don't know if Bacula will be Bacula, uh, showrunner Martin Garrow took to Instagram to thank the fans for their support and offered this regarding what lies ahead. Quote, our plans for season two are pretty wild and I don't want to spoil anything mm. now. Plus, there's still so many great season one episodes left. End quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the cast celebrated the news a little more exuberantly. Raymond Lee, Caitlin <laughs> Bassett, Mason Alexander Parkin, and Rissa Lee, oh, and Ernie Hudson appeared in a video repeating what Ben Song said before he was launched into space in the pilot. <laughs> oh, shit. 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 So they kept getting clipped off. What were they trying to say? Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. I guess because he was in space. Oh, shit. Time. That makes sense. Oh. Sure. The, the spaceship from Quantum Leap makes sense. Perfect. Ship. Yeah, I, and some folks, I guess this is the updated "oh boy" that uh, you know Beckett, uh, Sam Beckett would say "oh boy." I mm -hmm. guess nowadays, you know, these kids today, spicy. You know, I up. wondered if they were going to continue yeah. that, but they didn't, and they only did the "oh shit" once that I recall. I thought, right. "Oh, is that going to be the thing?" And right. they haven't right. done it over and over. That's true. Because Beckett was like, literally, you saw it at the beginning and end of every episode. Because as soon yeah. as he jumped into somebody else at the end, yeah, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. You know, season two is going to be like, oh fuck. 
I keep <laughs> punching it up here. Hey, good news. Quantum Leap returns to NBC as part of uh, the 2023 TV schedule, Monday, January 2nd at 10 p.m. All right. And can I mention yeah. one of the other cool things about Quantum Leap, yeah. that because yeah. of the structure of the show, I got back that I miss from appointment television. Yeah. And that's oh. the next week on Quantum Leap. Uh -huh. Because oh, the way yeah. it ends, mm -hmm. you get a peek into the next episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And though they're not really doing a, you know, here's what's coming up on next week. Yeah. You, you kind of do. You get to see, yeah. oh, he's leaping into this guy or this girl or this people, or he's in a farm or he's in on yeah. space or wherever. So you get mm -hmm. actually an idea of what's coming next. And that's mm -hmm. something that went away with. Now <laughs> you can stream it and they have a last time on as a button to skip it because you yeah. don't need it. You're binging <laughs> right. stuff anymore. But I, <laughs> exactly. You, know, you don't see that in most like network television. They don't have a coming up next because who knows yeah. what's coming up next? They have right. no idea. Oh, so, that's yeah. a good point. Just but like because that. of the structure mm -hmm. of what's happening. Right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you know that you pointed out, I also enjoy having to wait a week for it, you know, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, when you're caught up, that's what you do. And I don't I don't mind that. I like that uh, yeah. delayed gratification. As they say. I seriously well, it leaves the do pressure not mind from it. You. <laughs> yeah, because if, if you have 40 episodes to watch, and you're like, oh my God, I got to get through at least three more tonight. Right? <laughs> if you're caught up, you're caught up. <laughs> right, it is a job. Yeah. <laughs> hey, another 1980s news per my Christmas list. Uh, Beyond the Streets <laughs> and Golden Voiced, or Golden Aww. Voice, are pleased to announce Exhibit, the world's most comprehensive survey of the iconic New York City music trio Beastie Boys. Mm -hmm. is now open at uh, Beyond the Streets and Control Gallery in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. We know where Will's going on a road trip next. Mm -hmm. My wife was like, are you going to go? I was like, in what world? Am I just hopping <laughs> on a plane? I would love to, but yeah, no. I guess not. Oh. No. If only it would travel. Uh, born from the sonic irreverence of hardcore and punk, blended with the, I don't have to tell you guys, it's blended with the body and rebellious sounds of emergent hip-hop. New York City spawned a different kind of monster when it created Beastie Boys. Not the Beastie Boys, just like, Ramones. There's no the, by the way, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I say the Beastie mm -hmm. Boys all the time. Uh, right. But the alchemy of Adam Horowitz, Adam Yauch, and Michael Diamond transformed the music from grooves on wax to a sweeping cultural force, influencing expressions of art style and activism for generations to come. So, you know, you get a museum exhibit as a result of that, because when you create something <laughs> that exceeds the bounds of the genre that you're in... Uh, wow, mm -hmm. that's him. You know, you're important, and I agree. I think this is so cool, especially for you, Will. Um, even though you <laughs> never get to see it, and and perhaps anyone else who's a fan, but especially for you. Yes. I love that. I love that they're getting love, though. <laughs> yes, I was just talking. I think we were talking last week, not on mic, but right, yes. around the time we recorded the show. That I was just recently had licensed to ill playing on yes. Spotify. Mm -hmm. You did say that, and yeah. It's so good. And there's like only one track on there that I skip sometimes. Yep. But other than that, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's so re-listenable. Now, what is it? 30 years later or whatever? Mm -hmm. 30, 30 plus? I don't know. Something yep. like that. Bananas. Mm -hmm. It's like 30. Uh, that was what? 85, 36? Yeah. 35, 36 yep. years later. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Per the curator, Roger Gastman, quote, as much crazy Eddie as they are sneaker and sound <laughs> connoisseurs, <laughs> one would be hard pressed to find another entity so perfectly embodying the themes of beyond the streets, end quote. Mm -hmm. um, so what has this gotten hit? Well, uh, gotten this exhibit here from the earliest recordings. This is all from their uh, press release, you know, from yeah, the earliest okay. recordings to releasing seven multi-platinum albums. Exhibit offers a story dive into the group's near 40 year history, all told through a collection of personal items, artifacts, and ephemera, much of which mm -hmm. has never been seen by the public until now. Uh, <laughs> Ad Rock <laughs> says, quote, not only are we honored to be a part of Beyond the Streets, we're happy that someone besides us appreciates all the weird shit we've collected <laughs> and made music on for the past 40 years that will be on display, end quote. Perfect. Yeah, if you're in the area or have the uh, wherewithal, mm -hmm. like I do, uh, <laughs> exclusive merchandise and printed matter will be available within the gallery gift shop for the duration of the exhibit, which runs through January 23rd. Uh, hey, and finally, in uh, other 1980s news, per Variety, Harrison Ford praises Kiwi Kwan's comeback. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't too long ago that uh, Ford and Quan broke the internet and certainly this podcast yeah. uh, in September <laughs> when they yep. ran into each other at Disney's D23 and posed for a photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, we had shared that story of how that came to be. Very touching. Super touching. Mm -hmm. The moment was a reunion 38 years in the making as the two actors starred opposite one another in Steven Spielberg's 1984 adventure, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quan's role as Short Round marked his first ever movie. And I think the story was that wasn't his brother was auditioning and he was like, mom, yes. I want to audition too. 
Yeah, I think it wasn't. Yeah, the brother oh. the brother was slated to audition yeah. or be in it, but but they wanted him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can you imagine how yeah. pissed that brother must be to this day, <laughs> plotting his revenge? <laughs> yes, I I'm sure his brother got zero financial splashback from having an actor well, brother, but the recognition. Yeah, but he wanted to be uh, right. Sure yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we can get the backstory on that. Get him on the show, Will. <laughs> yeah. Get him oh, on the yeah. show. <laughs> Let's get the story. Let's get the angrier Quan on the show. <laughs> right. Tell me about that son of a bitch brother of yours. <laughs> Have you heard of this movie, uh, Temple of Doom? There's this kid in it. Same name as you. Hey, don't get me started. Uh, Ford said, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it was great to see him regarding his uh, their impromptu uh, reunion. Um, and since then, uh, Ford has had the opportunity to see everything everywhere all at once, which is part yeah. of Quan's big comeback here. You Ford said, quote, I've had the opportunity to see the film. He is really terrific in his movie, and I'm so glad to see him and what he has become. I'm so happy for him. He's such a happy guy, too. Boy, how many times does he say happy in this? Wow. That's a, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be. I mean, it's, we talked about this a little bit last time. I mean, oh, I don't that's know. a lot for Harrison Ford to say about happy. Right? Yeah, right? He was, probably, he was probably killing him the whole time. Or maybe he was stoned, because doesn't he? He's probably, he's, He's oh, to you, adults. You got to put that in your best Harrison Ford voice, though. You got to have the mumbling. Uh, Can you do it? I was fortunate enough to see you. I was, uh, was very happy to see you. I was very happy to see you. I was Indiana Jones, Chris. We can tell you're happy, Mr. Ford. So, yes, we can know. Yes, we can. I, I'm very happy. <laughs> He's clearly excited. Star Wars. <laughs> this, is, this is sounding more like him in a home uh, for actors at some point. How far removed are we from that already? Oh, no, 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 no. Star Wars. <laughs> he either yells out Jello or Star Wars. <laughs> your turn. Uh, your right. Turn, Jello is hungry. Star Wars, uh, I need changed. That's the. <laughs> when Op Rocks reporter Mike Ryan informed Ford that Quan is probably going to get an Oscar nomination for the film, Ford responded, quote, uh, all well deserved. Well deserved. Well deserved. Mm -hmm. very, very, very well deserved. Very happy. Jello! <laughs> Uh, Quan has won a handful of major prizes already this award season for this performance, for his performance in the A24 back to multiverse family drama. The mm -hmm. Gotham Awards gave him a supporting actor prize, mm -hmm. as did the New York Film Critics Circle and the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. And he's also nominated for a Golden Globe and Critics Choice Award. Go Holy cow. Dude. Who's, who's going to ask a tough question? Is it going to be me? Oh, oh, is there a tough question oh. to ask? Uh oh. Mm. I think mm. he was great in that role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was 800 awards great in that role. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think mm. he's getting some short round love mm. because of his comeback. Sure. No, I'm not, and I'm not begrudging him. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, like, yeah. that wasn't like, oh my God, the most incredible role <laughs> I've ever. No, it was like, oh, it's fantastic <laughs> to see that guy being a great, competent actor again. Right. It wasn't like, Where's the damn Oscar? Like, I did walk out mad. He didn't have an award yet. I'm just like, oh, great. Yeah. Is it just me or was it an amazing performance? And I'm just have my head up my ass. What no, is it? I, I see both. your point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I see your point. Yeah. Uh, ironically or coincidentally, if you had your head up your ass, you'd sound a lot like Harrison Ford. Oh, uh, yes. Excellent. Jello. <laughs> Jello. I think John's ass just asked for Jello. <laughs> What were you going to say, Kat, before you were really I, interrupted by me? Before I forget, <laughs> I, I see John's point, yeah. um, which and it, that hadn't occurred to me. I just, I know I loved the whole movie. Mm -hmm. I loved all the performances, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I guess I wouldn't say, oh, he was like so much more phenomenal than anyone else I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. But it is kind of cool that he's, he's getting this, uh, yeah. you know, it's like a refraction or <laughs> yeah. I think of, he uh, was pretty good and it was really cool to see him. And yeah. I think those two were kind of joining forces and people were like, you know what? Let's give him some awards. Cause we're so happy to see him yeah. in this pretty good role. <laughs> and that happens. That happens yeah, lots yeah. of times, yeah, right? Yeah. You can't okay. tell when it's, it's all right. a mm -hmm. mixture of goodwill or good. Uh, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're right. It's not Daniel day Lewis as Lincoln type, you know, level mm -hmm. of uh, sure. performance, right. yeah. but um he certainly did a good job, but I, I do take, I think, I think you're onto something there, John. But yeah, mm -hmm. but hey, there you go. You got it. Go for it. Oh, again, don't begrudge him. <laughs> go get Give it. him all the awards. <laughs> like, like those judges, I was also tickled to see him. So yep. I'm, I'm upset about that. Yeah. Cool. Yep. All right. Hey, that was 1980s news. Meow, 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 meow.
<laughs> no, thank you for doing that, Cat. No problem. All right. Hey, okay. So I think this we could just get to it here, right? Sorry. So hey, as I mentioned earlier at the top of the show, I want to talk to you guys about or present to you mm-hmm. some of the. Uh, I'm trying not to, uh, I guess, uh, you know, subjectively influence your perception of what I'm about to tell you. But okay. these okay. are, it's a handful or so, four or five. Indiana Jones scripts that were never made. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what's kind of interesting about it, maybe we're just sort of sort of see we're getting a peek behind the curtain, sort of, so to speak, is that even though the films I'm about to tell you about were never made, you're going to start recognizing elements in them mm-hmm. yep. uh, in films that were. Okay. And that probably happens mm-hmm. all the time, but probably unlike most film franchises, I would guess, there haven't been, hasn't been so much spaghetti thrown at a wall with regard to, mm-hmm. you know, the production of one or two films that they'd have all these options. Mm-hmm. Probably in part because you didn't have, you don't have George Lucas money or Steven Spielberg right. money to say, <laughs> let's hire a bunch of screenwriters and just see yeah. what we get. Yeah, that, that's mm-hmm. probably mm-hmm. part of it too. But also, I mean, this is Indiana Jones, yeah. right? Right. I mean, there's not a long list of rejected ideas for a Final Destination sequel. I mean, <laughs> right? it's like, it's what's your ideas? Here's my top five. That's a movie. Like nobody, <laughs> nobody's vetting that. But but Indiana Jones has a there's a certain cachet that it, it it's got yeah. to be a certain caliber. So I right. think that's probably why so many of these got frighteningly close before they didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it's like, you know what? It's not good enough. And they could just pull the plug. Cause like you said, they got Lucas money. Well, you're right. Just again, mm-hmm. how the hell did Crystal Skull get made then? Except that Spielberg was just worn down. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, and the, the three of them, Lucas Spielberg and Ford mm-hmm. uh, on a handshake. I don't know if it's in a, con- it might be actually in a contract. Mm-hmm. I think it was at the end of Last Crusade, or maybe it was the end of the first film, or Temple of Doom. At some point, the three of them decided that they would never make another Indiana Jones unless all three of them agreed. So mm-hmm. anytime we get a film, you know that there's a consensus among those three gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. Crystal Skull, whatever. M- Marcus sent that clip in, so Harris, F- Ford liked it. Spielberg just <laughs> caved, I think, and Lucas loves all of his own ideas. <laughs> So yes. Much like I like to hear myself talk. So Sorry, right, here. We go. Look, just because Ford said it was good, does not no. mean he believed it. It meant he was on a press tour. Yeah. How many celebrities do you see on the late night talk shows going? So tell me about your latest film. Oh, that turd. Do not go see that. I'm con- contractually obligated to tell you I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Well, don't so, waste your money. You know, <laughs> Let's take a little bit of a step back here uh, just to set the scene. So in the summer of 1970, oh, you know what? I should say special thanks to all the different, you know, sort of uh, articles and sites that I, uh, whose work I read in order to be able to, in some, some, in some instances, just straight up cribbed. Mm-hmm. Den of Geek, Screen Rant, Bloody Disgusting, Film School Rejects, and uh, 80s Kids. All right. There's probably links in the show notes if you want to read those things yourself. Probably. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. Uh, In the summer of 1977 on a beach somewhere in Hawaii, the two directors were hiding from the world. Steven Spielberg had barely survived uh, the grueling production of Closing Counters of the Third Kind. Mm. And George Lucas didn't want to know how bad his uh, sci-fi gamble was uh, doing. Uh So they were musing about other projects when Lucas brought up this idea he had been toying with for a while, a Saturday matinee James Bond. He told uh, Spielberg that he had an entire trilogy planned out for this old fashioned hero and they shook hands on the spot. But it turns out Lucas was full of shit. (laughs) In the Indiana Jones making the trilogy uh, documentary, Spielberg recalled that when Lucas first approached him for Raiders of the Lost Ark, he said, quote, George said, if I directed the first one, then I would have to direct a trilogy. He had three stories in mind. It turned out George did not have three stories in mind, and we had to make up subsequent stories, end quote. Oh, my goodness. I would not be surprised to hear that's how all kinds of creative deals are struck. You have to overplay your hand right, to right. get somebody comfortable enough to jump in with both feet. <laughs> it be something, right? To be like one of these guys, right? Lucas, Spielberg, you know, the Coppola runs with these guys, the Palm, you know, all these guys are coming mm-hmm. up together. Yeah. To be those that friend group that you still have to be looks and kind of just manipulate your friend Steven Spielberg <laughs> into doing a movie for you. I mean, that's just so rarefied air. It's just, right. can't and even. now he's got a reputation, right? It's, it's the holidays, you know. 
Who's bringing the cranberry sauce? Lucas, don't believe it. He's not going to show up with it. <laughs> Did he tell you he has three things? Because he's only bringing one. Yeah, he's, he's going to bring just one can. <laughs> yeah. Never going to be enough. Yeah. So what it turned out was is that Lucas only had loose concepts for the adventures well. <laughs> beyond Raiders of the Lost Ark. Beyond, A.K.A. plausible deniability. Yeah. <laughs> beyond what Raiders I meant by three Ark. movies was three ideas for movies. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, okay, hear me out. So Indiana Jones is in it. And um, he's on an adventure, right? And he's going after this thing. Oh, what do you hear about this thing? Uh, oh. thing. Um, Are we going to do the whip again? The whip is in it. Well, you know what? Actually, oh. I was thinking no whip. No, 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 no. the whip. We okay, we'll whip. keep the whip. Whatever you want, Steve. But this time um, he loves snakes. That's the one. So look, he's only got these ideas, but when the finally Raiders of the Lost Ark comes out, it's a big success. Suddenly he needs to actually come up with <laughs> hard and fast screenplays. Another story. <laughs> so Lucas pitched at that time, he starts pitching these far-fetched ideas to Spielberg who rejects them for one reason or another. Uh -huh. and that's what I'm going to tell you about here. So in sort of, I told you there's this running recurring theme of you're going to recognize some of these elements. And you're like, haven't sure. I seen this on film before? Or afterward, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. Take, taking a step back and to that point, remember in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the fight scene in Shanghai, or when he escaped from the airplane using an inflatable raft to slide down mm -hmm. a Himalayan slope? Do you remember in Raiders of the Lost Ark, the minecart chase? How about when he used the giant <laughs> gong as a shield to avoid submachine gun fire? Um, actually, yeah. <laughs> those are all things, but weren't in that movie. <laughs> These are all things Lucas wanted in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. Uh, Lawrence Kasdan, you know, the uh, <laughs> legendary uh, scribe, said uh, some of them are going to be way too expensive to do, and oh, yeah. some of them mm -hmm. are just fucking ridiculous, George. <laughs> are you serious? An inflatable each, raft? Each and every one of those is a huge set piece. Each and every one of yeah, those right. is, is like, was a cornerstone of the movie that right. it ended up in. And they just want to lump them all in the first film. Really? So, of course, uh, you know, none of these things wound up in Raiders. Right. Um, but when Lawrence Kasdan- I was trying really hard. Yeah. I was really like, I've seen that movie so many times. No, I didn't see that. But you recognize him, right? <laughs> yes, it I think familiar, so. seems right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're, yeah, they're all in Temple of Doom. So uh, yeah. when it comes time to, to actually do it, this is the first sequel now, right? And George has got all, all these ideas. So ultimately they do get, to, they do Temple of Doom. Yeah, yeah. Lawrence okay. Kasdan doesn't want anything to do with it. When George tells him what he wants it to be about, Kasdan's like, no, thank you. I do not want to be associated with this thing. It sounds too dark and, you know. So instead, Lucas re recruited uh, Willard Hike and Gloria Katz, the husband and wife writing team that he'd worked with on American Graffiti. Mm -hmm. They uh, did some uncredited work on Star Wars, the original, The New Hope. They wrote mm -hmm. Temple of Doom ultimately, and in the future, they're going to write Howard the Duck. And <laughs> they wound up incorporating many of George's ideas into that mm -hmm, script. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Here's the, here, let's get on our own mind cart to ride of sorts here. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, so, so, uh, so uh, Bill Hike and Gloria Katz write Temple of Doom. It opens in the summer of 1984. This is when I snuck across the highway to see it with some friends and, you know, right. was killed on the way there. <laughs> right. Or yeah, on yeah, the way that back, story. Either, yep. both. Um, but it opens to a confused public. I don't remember feeling so confused. I remember feeling like, did he just shish kebab a guy? <laughs> shish kebab. Did this, right? I remember that first thing. I was like, this is how this is open. This is bananas. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then when you get to the later stuff, yeah, it's like, holy cow. But I was, you know, all of what, 14 years old or something. So I was like, yeah. yes. Right. It was yeah. exciting. Well, there was like some horror movie injected into that. You know, some yeah. of that was yes. stuff you only saw in scarier movies, but mm -hmm. now it was kind of in the, it, but a lot of it was like in the daylight. Well, this was in the cave, but yeah. it was like, <laughs> it, it was open to be seen. It wasn't like just happening in the dark, you know, by right. some, yes. some masked it it, monster. <laughs> it made it okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's Palatable. okay. <laughs> Palatable. There we go. <laughs> oh, it led to the PG-13 rating system. Right, right. 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 <laughs> yep, right. But uh, look, I love the film, but most other folks, it seems it's mixed, but a lot of folks don't like it because they say it was so inconsistent with the more family friendly swashbuckly tone of the first film. Mm -hmm. um, and many compared it unfavorably to another 1984 adventure movie, Romancing mm -hmm. the Stone. Which I loved. Yeah. which Yeah. And again, and yeah. that feels a lot more like Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It does. And it, it turns does. out actually, even though folks that say that Romancing the Stone was just a copy of Indiana Jones, in a sense, the screenwriter had oh. written it actually before Indiana Jones came out. So Really? Oh, so yeah. uh, I want to tell you about Indiana Jones in the Castle of Blood, also known as Indiana Jones and the Haunted Mansion. Uh, I found it. <laughs> 
both ways, at least online. <laughs> Castle of Blood. Yeah. So what do you do when you now want to come up with a third film and you're short on ideas? <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> <laughs> or like George Lucas, you just want to put them all in. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, this is a running theme. I'm a fan of, oh, look, I love Indiana Jones. I love Star yeah. Wars. I don't love all of the films. Right, right. And yeah. I've said this before. The ones that I like the least out of these franchises is the ones that George had the most influence in. <laughs> the most in input, yeah. That's an interesting <laughs> point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. When you take away Kasdan, who in the first movie was like, George, this stuff is bonkers. You can't put this in here. Kasdan's out. He gets the people he's worked with since the very beginning who he could just say, look, you got to put all this stuff in. Whatever you want, George. <laughs> right? That's what it seems yeah, like. Yeah. I get the impression that Lucas is just this this chaotic force of nature who absolutely can get the ball over the line and get something done, Mm -hmm. but he needs somebody to rein him in (laughs) because like, yeah, you'll get there on your own, but it's not going to be pretty. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you can, if you can contain that use as an engine to drive and motivate and push other creative people over the line, that's when they actually produce gold. He needs good editing. (laughs) Hey, we talked about uh, Marshall Lucas. Yeah. That's Brian right. Volkweiss yeah. uh, a couple yep. months ago. BV Dubs. <laughs> yes. That's right. When you need a third film now, what do you do? You've just been unfavorably compared to 1984's Romancing the Stone. So you just go out and hire the woman who wrote that. <laughs> Perfect. So Lucas just approaches Diane Thomas. Uh-huh. By the way, she's waiting tables at a roadside diner when she sold Romancing the Stone to Michael Douglas wow. for $250,000. It was the <laughs> eighth highest grossing movie of 1984 on a mm-hmm. third of Temple of Doom's budget. Mm. Wow. So now they've got a screenwriter. Mm-hmm. Spielberg wants to make the third film more like The Spirit of Raiders. They got mm-hmm. burned on Temple of Doom. Mm-hmm. Lucas mm-hmm. wants to push for even more horror. Mm. Now, some folks believe, and I think they even the creators of the film, Temple of Doom, have said this even themselves. When they were creating it, they were both going through divorces. And they believe oh, the yeah. film reflects how they were feeling sort of just about life darker you know wow yeah. more of a nihilistic mm. wow mm-hmm, mm-hmm. turmoil and how i feel about the show every now fuck it <laughs> as a result <laughs> wow uh, because lucas wanted more horror though and he's the big boss in charge of you know spielberg's a, a hired hand in a sense right although i said mm-hmm. the three of these guys get to have to agree mm-hmm. but as a result of uh, lucas's influence thomas's script followed indiana jones on a universal horror style adventure into a sprawling haunted castle. Mm -hmm. Oh. Unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot about it, but ultimately Spielberg rejects the ghost story because he says it's too similar to Poltergeist, which he had written and produced. Mm -hmm. He didn't direct it. Toby Hooper directed it. No matter what Uh you hear, that's not true. (laughs) But Lucas was still keen on the notion of a horror film for Indiana Jones. Okay. Somebody come, somebody get George and put him to bed. He needs his nap. (laughs) He's still talking about the horror thing. Yes. So he turns to a writer with experience in the genre. Clive Barker. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So this takes us to Indiana Jones and the Monkey King, also known as Indiana Jones and the Garden of Life. Mm -hmm. Don't don't these all make uh, Dial of Destiny sound like a fantastic title? Right. right? Yes. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Suddenly, Dial of Destiny is really clever. So still only in his mid-20s at the time, Chris Columbus had already written three films for Amblin Mm. Entertainment, Spielberg's production company, the one he co-founded with Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy. Oh. He had uh, written Gremlins, The Goonies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was going to write Young Sherlock Holmes as well. Mm-hmm. So Columbus gets hired to write a, a draft of another Lucas pitch. As of all Indiana Jones movies, now this has got to be the this has got to be the most bonkers one. Of oh, them, I can't I wait! <laughs> of all the movie, like all the movies, it opens with a special, like John said, a Bond like sequence at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, that that is really the conclusion of his previous off screen adventure. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Uh, in this instance, Columbus started the story in a haunted house in Scotland. Oh, George, he's not letting it go. <laughs> and things just kick off in the supernatural way right away. Okay. The opening sequence sees Indy facing off against Baron Seamus Seagrove III, a bona fide g- g- ghost who brings <laughs> suits of armor to life. <laughs> already if you, suits of armor to life is familiar i just realized that that's something that kind of happens in young sherlock holmes the chris that chris columbus wrote the stained glass window a well, night, stained glass yeah oh really it's oh. like a suit of armor that comes to life oh yeah 
I was yeah. just thinking of Bill and Ted when I think of suits of armor moving around. Oh, so. yes. <laughs> oh, you're <fine>. Unrelated. <laughs> no. yeah. It's almost like maybe Lucas had a really great ghost pun for Harrison Ford. I'm like, we got to <laughs> we gotta find a way for him to say it. Yes. We got to. Mm. Yeah. Could not do it. So in this, as the story continues, of course, like most of these stories, Indy re- returns briefly to his university, probably to pick up a check, you know, from his actual job. <laughs> <laughs> After meeting with Marcus, he jets off to Mozambique to meet zoologist Claire Clark, who has found evidence leading to a lost city of Sun Wu Kong, the Monkey King. Which hmm. is it's kind of weird that this is Chinese mythology, but he found this uh, thing and she found this in Africa. Yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> What's up with that? Maybe that's like a Pangea <laughs> thing, you know? Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah, a cradle yeah, of yeah. life. Uh, I don't know. It's where the Dial of Destiny was. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah everything's <laughs> there. Yeah, it's like the Kmart for relics. <laughs> Kmart's a relic. What am I saying? <laughs> Speaking of. Yeah. Legend has it that the lost city is home to the mystical garden of immortal peaches. Oh. So, but I need to understand. Yes. Are the peaches immortal? Yes. Or do they contain properties that grant immortality to those who oh. would consume them? Have you ever noticed, honey, did you ever notice this peach is never rotting? I'm afraid to eat it. <laughs> Must be crazy chemicals. In. Where did you get this? Yeah. There's a sticker on it. Mozambique. <laughs> if lost, please return to the cradle of life. You're right, John. I don't know. But the f- way you describe it sounds like a terrible MacGuffin to just have a delicious That's treat. That's the twist that never, at the end. You, know, you thought they were going to give you immortality. Ha ha. Joke's like, on you. Finally, I can make that cobbler. <laughs> and it's an immortal cobbler. Harrison, do the ghost Harrison one. Ford mm. making the MacGuffin. Nearly, nearly scared the life out of me. Oh, and you know what, John? Actually, it does say. It does say. The Garden of Immortal Peaches, the fruit has the power to grant eternal life. You know, the holy grail of Chinese mythology. Well, thanks for clearing yeah, that up. <laughs> so anyway, naturally, Indy and his colleagues aren't the only ones keen to find the, the mystical power. As you're going to see in a future film here, our hero once again goes up against the Nazis. Sig oh, Heil. But they're not just ordinary Nazis in the Monkey King. No. Oh. In the Monkey King, the German soldiers uh. were to be can, can, commanded by Lieutenant Werner von Mephisto. That's a little on the nose. Oh. And hmm. Sergeant Helbert Gutterberg, who is a brute with a mechanical arm that doubles as a gun. Now, I can see the angle there because yep. there is a lot, you know, around World War II and the Nazis kind of tinkering with mm, uh, yeah. supernatural forces and yes. it, it, dabbling mm-hmm. in stuff like that. I mean, look, I've played all the Wolfenstein sequels. I know the, what's, <laughs> I know what the zombie's been up to. I've seen a guy with a robot arm that's also a gun. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's the beginning of this article of the thread of... Of trying to inject things into these indie films that that make sense temporally, like as they're going, mm-hmm. and we know that the Dial of Destiny is leaping forward to indie's current age, which is like sixty nine or something. You said right, and so mm-hmm. like, see, it makes sense, uh, I guess. But already to me, it's feeling that little mix of genres, you know, that sort of bugged me that we've talked about way too many times. Yeah, you? I know that bothers but, you. Yeah. But um, okay, mm-hmm. so in his uh, Chris uh, Columbus's script also contains a tank chase. It's almost identical to the one ultimately in Last Crusade. But in oh, Columbus's wow. script, the Nazis have a super tank that's three stories tall. Yep, perfect. What? <laughs> Joining, um, that's the perfect amount of height, <laughs> perfect amount of stories for a, a Nazi <laughs> tank, by the way. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> oh, whatever. I just picture Lucas like he's like, you know, getting Spielberg. Look, no, no, no. It's not going to be a regular tank. <laughs> it's going to be, and he's, as he says it to Spielberg, he can tell he's not impressed. It's going to be two stories right. tall. Uh, uh, th- uh, three <laughs> stories tall. Did I say tall. two? <laughs> Well, that's a, that's Joining, a hell of a tank, three stories tall. Joining in the in his new oh, hi, love Elvis. interest, Doctor Clark, are Tiki, a two hundred year old pygmy who knows the way to the lost city. Plus, um, Scraggy, they're t- <laughs> that's almost scrap. Scraggy, that's scra- Plus, Ruh-roh. Scraggy, yeah. they're Ruh-roh tough Ruh-roh guide Indy. to the jungle. It's a combo of Shaggy and Scrappy. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. Scraggy. That's got to be how they came up with these names. You know, a lot of the characters' names are based on dogs, right? <laughs> Like Indiana Jones, Indiana is the name of George Lucas's dog. We named the dog Indiana. Right? Wow. Let me see if I get this straight. Uh, Willie, you know, Willie Scott in Temple of Doom. Willie is the Spielberg's dog. It was named Willie. Okay. Oh, is that right? Okay. And Short Round was actually the name of Bill Hike's dog. The guys, the people who wrote uh, Temple of Doom. <laughs> um, and that, that name actually came from a character from an older movie. But anyway. Okay. Also to the surprise of Indy, Betsy Tuffett a love-struck student of Indy's with whom he had a fling. Oh. Oh, boy. Mm. Uh-huh. She mm-hmm. stowed away 
<laughs> so she could be close to her professor. Oh, oh boy. No. Um, this creepy. Is, yeah. Well, oh. yes. And if I'm that, hearing the police playing in the background. <laughs> oh, oh. I wonder if it's that character in Readers who has the love you on her eyelids. It, right. It, could, the be. Heart it could be. Yep. Yep. <laughs> See, that would make sense because in yeah. her script, well, this gets even a little weirder and creepier, but so maybe it's tragic. The script mm -hmm. treats Betsy as a comic relief character, but she's become so obsessive about Indy, she declares that she will kill herself if she can't have him. Ah. And it's not just talk. She she proceeds to attempt to hurt herself on multiple occasions, including hanging herself with Indy's whip and dousing herself in bourbon in an effort to set herself on fire, all of which is supposed to be played for laughs. The, what? <laughs> so this is George Lucas's idea? These well, I, well, this ideas? is Chris Columbus's script. I don't know if he, he encouraged him to put that part in there. I think we could recognize George. So go in the full Marion, right? Just That's all weird. bourbon and fire. Yeah. Not content with just Nazis wow. as villains. In The Monkey King, Indy would also wind up facing against pirates that traveled by riverboat, leading to an epic sword fight in a boat that's about to go over a waterfall. Makes hmm. sense. Then they encounter good. primitive tribes while traipsing through the jungle with attacks from gorillas and rhinos, leading to an another epic chase sequence in which Indy rides a rhino. No. Mm. No. <laughs> so far, we've talked about the uh, most ordinary aspects of this story. The mundane, no. the trite. Mm. Uh, well, the banal oh does that mean boring is also banal Banal sure. is sort of basic yeah, yeah. <laughs> as if all body, of that it's not body it's not body it's though. not body or tawdry no. <laughs> or tawdry yeah either way <laughs> well some of it was tawdry maybe uh -huh. as if that wasn't enough uh, insane animal action the zoologist is also able to make bird calls which summon huge swarms of birds to come down and peck the Nazis <laughs> You're making attack, this up. Attack Nazi <laughs> peckers. Oh. <laughs> and there are hordes of intelligent gorillas who fiercely defend the jungle home from outsiders, mm -hmm. including uh, at some point the gorillas take over the three-story tank. <laughs> oh. And Indy has a new sidekick <laughs> named Mowgli. Mowgli? <laughs> Finally, Indy and, uh, uh, and his company uh, make it to the Garden of Immortal Peaches, but in a shocking twist, Indy sustains fatal injuries and dies. Credits. But you could eat a peach, right? Well, yes, you're right. That's a better idea. <laughs> no, of course. Well, you must have already eaten a peach. You can't use it as a salve to bring right. back the dead. Oh, man. Like stuffing in his dead mouth. <laughs> it's not working. He's not swallowing. He would sound exactly the same. <laughs> I've got a peach in my mouth. <laughs> he would mumble. Is it, use it as a suppository. Get it in the bloodstream. <laughs> oh, man. Of course, the mystical fruit is able to bring him back to life, Cat. Yes. Oh, good. Phew. But... <laughs> One of the wicked pirates discovers eating the peach will only give life to those with a pure heart, while oh. the, those that are evil will be destroyed. Ah, Whoa. sounds familiar. Would melt as if, mm. as if made of wax and looking at the Ark of the Covenant. I was, I was okay with the pirate part. That, that was okay. But oh, were you? Know. Yeah. Pirate part. <laughs> This, this uh, film actually did get to the point of location scouting, but eventually Lucas and Spielberg uh, shelved it, uh, feeling that the script is a little too far-fetched. That must have been Spielberg saying that. And in danger of racially stereotyping some of its characters. They did get some of that criticism uh, with the Temple of Doom, uh, saying that they had been, hadn't been particularly sensitive to Indian culture. Mm -hmm. yep. Look, ultimately we get Last Crusade, which as you know, some of the elements from that film survive in Last Crusade, this idea of uh, something that could bring eternal life, the end, mm -hmm. you know, where you got to choose wisely, that type of ending, right? Mm -hmm. the tank, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. return of Nazis, all that. Some of those things are in there. Mm -hmm. So now I want to talk to you about Indiana Jones and the saucer men from Mars. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So after Last Crusade uh, <laughs> concluded, it, it was supposed to be the end of the trilogy. Remember, George said he yeah. had three <laughs> trilogy and he had all the ideas figured out already. <laughs> so knowing that he made that the part up about the ideas, you know he was going to do more than three films. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they're making money. We've said that oh, before. Yes. You know, It's the final. It's not the final. As long yeah. as the final one made money, there's a reboot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so when the 90s roll around, George, uh, I shouldn't say George. It sounds so disrespectful. Lucas was once again in make, uh, interested in making another indie film. So in 1993, he hires writer Jeb Stewart, who wrote The Die Hard, to take a crack at a new script set after the original movies. At this point, Lucas wants to introduce aliens into the franchise, 
bridging the gap between the 40s pulp serials that he grew up on and the mm-hmm. 1950s atomic age science fiction that he, you know, mm-hmm. uh, came, mm-hmm. came of age. Stewart's script, here we go again. Again, you see this pattern here. Stewart, Stewart's yeah. script contains flesh eating ants. Wow. And Indy survives a nuke scene. Oh. And Indy getting married to his love interest. Mm-hmm. Eventually, Stewart is, gets replaced by writer Jeffrey Bohm, who had written The Last Crusade. He also wrote Inner Space, The Lost Boys. He wrote two of the four Lethal Weapon yep. films. Mm-hmm. This guy's a very accomplished screenwriter. You know, of all of these, yeah. this is the one, despite the fact that it stinks so much of Crystal Skull, yeah. <laughs> it's the one that I most would have liked to see oh, produced. Well, okay. Ah. Mm. Because I, I know it has the, the genre crossing thing that you don't necessarily care for, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. this is what I was talking about. I alluded to earlier where yeah. they're connecting the, the 40 serials, like then they're contending, okay, well, if India is 10, 15 years older, uh-huh. now it's the 50 serials, which were very much Buck Rogers and outer space kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So it's almost like you're taking the spirit of the serialized, you know, swashbuckler and moving him in through decades, which I was okay with. And it, it didn't, what I had said, this is of the, all these, the one I'd read about a little before, yep. it didn't sound as bad as what Crystal, Crystal Skull ended up being, but yep. mm-hmm. I mean, we know what ended up happening, but. <laughs> I, th- I think that sounds like a really cool idea and, and you know, in concept that it evolves mm-hmm. in the way that the, the era of the character evolves. But mm-hmm. I think it's interesting because it's novel, like other films that, I'm trying to think like Bond, obviously over the decades, it always is an espionage, you know, spy action adventure movie. They never said, well, this one was made in the 60s. So what's what's now popular now? Now 70s, now it's 80s. You know, they didn't. They just stuck to that. No, I got to challenge you. I mean, look, we went to outer space because it was the space yeah. race. I yes. mean, James Bond kind of tapped in. We always had the most modern technology. And mm-hmm. so he wasn't he wasn't espionaging the way he was in the sixties anymore when he's in the two thousands, you know, he, mm, he had different gadgets and different stuff. Now you're right. It was exactly the same genre throughout, but they mm-hmm. definitely tapped into what was, you know, the zeitgeist maybe of what's going on. You know, we had, we had those series of them that were kind of like smoking the bandit where you had the, yeah. <laughs> the dumb redneck cop that was always mm. after him, you know, yeah, things like that where they definitely brought in other little genres to tack on to bond. Which I think mm-hmm. is probably why it, I don't find it so distasteful for an indie film. Yeah, I do seem like that seems like a less mm-hmm. of a swing to me. But it seems more I think like you're a, right. Oh, I would agree. I would agree. It's like a mm-hmm. fine tuning, you know, versus but right, right, right. Well, um, and to your point, I think the key difference is indie is a thing born of the '40s. Yeah, and if that's the thing that makes him so great, you don't want to see him evolve into different eras. You want him to see that be that same kind of, you know. Mm-hmm. The, the guy with the leather jacket and the hat yeah. and the cow. Right. Why would he have a whip in, you know, right. 1969? You know, right. well, why? Just have a pistol, have a taser, right? Oh, it's all those right. things. You almost don't want to see him yeah. evolve. Whereas James Bond right. was always the bleeding edge guy. So I get that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Instead of a leather yeah. jacket, he's got some really wide lapel. Mm-hmm. Uh, awful. <laughs> really skinny tie. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh. Double breasted leather jacket. <laughs> That's what. The, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, George, if you're going to be consistent with your own concept. Uh, anyway, so in this film, uh, Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men from Mars, Indy nearly gets married at the beginning of it to a linguist named uh, Dr. Elaine McGregor. Among the guests at the wedding were to be uh, Marion, mm-hmm. Willie, Sala, and his father, uh, Henry Jones Sr. So we're going to have all the folks from the other films come back. But instead uh-huh. of walking down the aisle to tie the knot, McGregor hops into a car on the big day and disappears. And Mm-mm. so a search is kicked off uh, to find her. It turns out that she's working on a discovery of alien bodies in a strange stone cylinder. And Indy and uh, McGregor have been working on the code on said cylinder, which turns out to be coordinates that lead them to a mountain. Now this is sounding like close encounters to me. It's going to get Okay. There. Anyway, Russian spies want in, and as Indy tries to rescue Elaine from one of their planes, a flying saucer appears. Uh, A further alien encounter sees a truck being lifted off the ground. Meanwhile, a mysterious countdown clock ticks away with the assumption being that it's a bomb. You you just broke it for me, Will. I mean, you you really, I I think, you you described it very well. You did nothing wrong, but when I envisioned, like, Indiana Jones looking over his shoulder and his UFO. Yeah. It breaks it. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's pretty weird. Yeah. It's in a contemporary plane, uh, whatever that would have been. Changed you know. my mind in real time. All right. Awesome. <laughs> You're, you know, good. That's great. It's great when people evolve. Um, John's evolving. <laughs> toward Will's opinion. 
<laughs> yes, everyone does eventually. Oh. And so the story progresses until the eventual departure of the flying saucers and aliens. After giving the villains their comeuppance, which of course, you know, in Indiana Jones style, it's always, the, they don't realize the power, the awesome power that they mm -hmm. sought after mm -hmm. and it, you know, destroys them. Uh, mm -hmm. Indy and Elaine are free to go off and get married. In fact, Short Round was set to make a, a cameo at the end and give them a lift oh. in the car. Oh. Th this shows that he, he, Lucas was thinking about aliens back then. <laughs> and just just like uh, Monkey King, just like the Haunted Mansion, he was going to continue to try to get certain elements of these films into the film that actually gets made. With each right. new screenwriter, mm -hmm. he's going to repeat those ideas and see what sticks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you didn't like enough of them, you're yeah. fired. I'm going to bring another screenwriter. Right. That's what, I have some yes. great ideas. <laughs> That's what it seems like. Until somebody, somebody agrees with them and he's like, you're the guy. Yeah. Darn it, I'm getting Organic. aliens in here somehow. <laughs> uh, but, but Spielberg and Ford weren't uh, too keen on the using aliens as a plot device. Spielberg in particular yeah. had no interest in it because he had done it already in E.T. and Close Encounters. Close Encounters, yep. Uh, but by 1995, Jeffrey Bohm had shaped it into a script that convinced them it might work. But Spielberg shut down the project after seeing Independence Day, feeling like they couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. Spielberg was so impressed by Independence Day, what was done on screen, he said, it has everything you could ever want, plus aliens, so we shouldn't even be, <laughs> you know, going into that plus genre, aliens. that market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so that film doesn't happen. So, you know, and that's in, what, in the 90s, right? I said, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. I want to tell you guys now about Indiana Jones. And this is the last one, Indiana Jones in the city of the gods. Mm -hmm. So in the early two thousands, Spielberg warmed to the idea of another Indiana Jones film after conceiving an idea where Indy was assailed by Nazi war criminals following the events of world war two. Mm -hmm. And so they hired uh, the walking dead's uh, former writer, director, walking dead, put that aside. <laughs> Talking about Frank Darabont. This article talks oh. about him as the writer of Walking Dead. Please right. respect this man. He wrote and directed three Stephen King films. Before yeah. that, Shawshank Redemption, The Green okay. Mile, The Mist. Mm -hmm. He also mm -hmm. wrote, you see, three of my favorite horror films from the 1980s, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, oh, The Blob, okay. and yeah. Fly 2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Walking Dead. Oh, garbage show. <laughs> got, it's, and the show stunk after Darabont left too, by the way. Anyway, so they That's hired like, Darabont. What did we talk about recently? Who yep. was it who was mentioned? Um, oh, the actor, uh, actor from Friends. You know, she, oh, she was in something really recent. And she oh, was it was in, like Jennifer Aniston or someone. And it was like, oh, you know, Jennifer Aniston from The Help or like whatever odd movie right, she was, was in. Like, oh, was it right. what she was most known as? Yeah, I remember that. But not yeah. the, yeah, it wasn't Jennifer Aniston. The one who played Phoebe, I guess. I don't, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. long. But anyway, yeah. We had that happen. <laughs> right. Recently. Right. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right. yeah, they, yeah. They, they dropped her credit as being the most obscure credit right. because right. it was what they were currently promoting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably some young person wrote this piece that I borrowed this from. <laughs> anyway, Darabont sent his script in, 19, in the 1950s and introduced us to an Indiana Jones who was 20 years past his best days. Now, again, some of this is going to sound familiar to you. Andy still conducts research expeditions. And thanks to the antics of a Russian colleague, he finds himself in the possession of one of the infamous 13 crystal skulls. Ooh. Anyway, Darabont also brings back Marion as the person who recruited this Russian to, to uh, try to obtain this skull mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. And we learned that Marion is married, not to Indy, to somebody else. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. And is on a quest to find the lost city of the gods. And the skull is believed to hold the secrets of this place. Well, I'm just going to cut to the end here. Uh, at the city of the gods, aliens appear when the skull is attached to the necessary skeleton. I should just have my little mm -hmm. bing sound here every time right. we every time we see something in a we know we've seen this in a movie. <laughs> uh, but here the uh, aliens uh, anoint Indy and the four people that are accompanying him as the five chosen ones, and as thanks for helping uh, them bring uh, their remains back to life, they each get one wish granted. Infinite wishes. Always ask for infinite wishes. <laughs> well, John, just maybe this will this will scare you off of that, or at least okay. Have you rethink it? Because just like every other Indiana Jones film, some of them pick something that leads to their demise. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I want infinite money uh -huh. and like a pile of gold crushes them. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when Indy wishes, however, to be reunited with Marion, again, who's already married to somebody else, huh. everything around them begins to collapse. As the survivors flee, a flying saucer emerges from the ground. Shortly afterward, it crashes, <laughs> destroying the city of gods in the ensuing explosion. Mm. Indian Marion return to America and are wed. Oh. 
So I guess her husband died. Just yeah, what happened to him? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I want to know. Oh. Well, never think he made a bad wish. He's <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe he wished for a divorce from Marion. <laughs> bad wish. <laughs> There's some terrible relationship uh, events mm-hmm. happening yes. in these ideas. Yeah. <laughs> By very sour men. Very unhealthy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Darabont's script, a draft of which, by the way, famously leaked after Crystal Skull came out. This Darabont script, uh, supposedly it purported to be his. He's never denied it or accepted it, acknowledged it mm-hmm. as his own. But anyway, as I described to you, it, in, it wound up integrating elements from the previous films, like Nazis are even in this. I talked about the Russians being the big bad, but they do have elements of the Nazis sort of, I think, taking it sort of at the beginning and sort of, you know, then sort of uh, rolling over into the Russians as the bads of the, as the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, okay. but then it also updates it in the way that Lucas wanted, the way John's describing, making it more contemporary, at least until sure. the period in which it's set. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See, that's the thing that's weird for me, John, is it, they're making it contemporary to the fictional world. Like Bond gets contemporary based on our world. That's true. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that's not almost a little meta that way. He's being updated the way his yeah. influence was updated, not the yeah. way the world is updated. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but maybe that you know maybe that's not true because just like you said, our interest in science fiction and this atomic age stuff at the time, well, a lot of it was a metaphor for you know for the Red Scare and the Cold yeah. War and that sort of thing, but. Uh, some things in the real world were happening to influence that too. So maybe maybe it's the same thing. I don't know, whatever. But but well, let's, let's go back to the moment where you said I was right. Because that's how I heard it. Uh, about the, U- the UFO. With you're the right, Will. Over, you're like, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I've never heard anything more correct. Spielberg and Ford were reportedly happy with Darabont's screenplay. But Lucas. Of course. Uh, um, what is he? Something, John? He's the dick in the coleslaw. What was it? Oh, no. I'm, what was, where pickle. does he get these the, things? What was that Southern expression you were teaching us about? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, right. certainly, that's certainly not something I've ever said on a microphone. Um, <laughs> so Lucas wanted more emphasis on science fiction. Really? That wasn't yeah. enough? Okay. Well, anyway, so Lucas, what does he do? Just like John predicted, he hires another screen. The writer. <laughs> yep. And he hires him to write a draft called Indiana Jones and the Atomic Ants. <sighs> What? Oh boy. <laughs> anyway, we're not going to talk about that one. Uh, ultimately, David no? Kep writes the film that I became hear about it, Crystal. I don't know anything about it. Ultimately, <laughs> David Kep writes the film that becomes Crit Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. As you know, as you recognized, uh, a number of Darabont's <laughs> ideas found their way into Crystal Skull. And I think some of the ones we discussed earlier, too, from maybe Chris Columbus's script or some, somebody else's script, even, too. Yeah, they continue to leak in there, don't they? Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> this one, folks who have read it, and it is available online. By most accounts, again, folks who read it believe it would have been a more effective, more successful, more popular film than Crystal mm-hmm. Skull. Crystal Skull ultimately was. Mm-hmm. And why wasn't it used? Because Lucas, <laughs> Lucas didn't Lucas. like it. Yeah, because Lucas. But don't take my word for it. Darabont oh. explains that uh, it was Lucas who ruined his uh, day, and that ultimately he wasted a year writing on the script that got trashed. Uh, Darabont uh, told uh, MTV in uh, 2007 that he confronted George Lucas over the matter, saying, quote, I told him he was crazy. (laughs) You have a fantastic script. I think you're insane, George. And he says, this again, this is all Darabont. You can say things like that to George, and he doesn't even blink. He's one of the most stubborn men I know. End quote. (laughs) When he was asked whether he'd publish his script, uh, Darabont said, quote, at this point, I don't give much of a damn what George thinks, but I wouldn't want to harm my friendship with Stephen. End quote. Ah. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Look, I am often bemoaning uh, Kingdom of it's the right. Crystal Skull, but things could have been worse. It could have hey, been worse. Can I, can I take a moment here and ask you both a philosophical question yeah. about the Crystal Skull? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So this is this is a two part, three pronged, four subsection question. Okay. Oh right. my. There's a couple of pieces. I'm going to take the second part first. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> So first, I'll have one I'm problem, curious, <laughs> when you first saw The Crystal Skull, mm-hmm. before you had an opportunity to bounce your opinions off of other people and get into the echo chamber of the internet and the rest of the world, was your opinion better or worse than it is today? And the second part of it is, when is the last time you actually watched it objectively to see if it is as bad as the world screams that it is. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll start. When I first saw it, I yeah. thought it was disappointing, yeah. uh-huh. but I wasn't mad at it. I'm like, oh, so this is what Indiana Jones is now. Okay. 
<laughs> and then and then I, I learned, oh, the things that bothered me really bothered everyone so I can hate it. And also I'll say I have not watched it probably since the second time I saw it, maybe a year after it came, when it hit uh, DVD or whatever, I saw it again. Mm -hmm. But I've not seen mm -hmm. it since then. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? Kat, we'll, we'll start with you. I've seen it once. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it was on... Uh, I forget if it was DVD or VHS. Did you say on an airplane? <laughs> and I had no choice? <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> no. no What did you think of it at the time? In this room, um, I I didn't love it. Mm -hmm. I think I was fine with it. I'm trying to remember because it was a little while ago. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but actually it was within it was within five years ago. And um, Okay. Recent. Okay. Yeah, pretty recent. And I I didn't have any and anything coming at me, you know, uh, I wasn't in any chamber of, of mm -hmm. anything. I was just, just watching it with my husband. I think, I don't remember if he had seen it. I think he wanted to rewatch it. Mm -hmm. I might've had an inkling that it wasn't the best Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> gotcha. And I didn't, I didn't come out of it thinking, wow. But I also wasn't like, oh, that stank. I just was yeah. like, okay, yeah. it was fine. Um, but I am curious to watch it again, actually. Yeah. Because I'm Absolutely. feeling that as as we get closer to the Dial of Destiny, I've got to rewatch everything. Mm, and I'm yes. thinking to myself, maybe when I watch this one, the Crystal Skull again is going to be different. I don't know. What about you, Will? All right. I saw it when it opened. You know, back then when it came out, I think it was 2007. It wasn't like we okay. are we, we have today where, you know, uh, taking it back to when we were kids, you know, we talked about this before. When a film opened on a weekend, it opened on a Friday night at like 7 right. p.m. Now when a film opens on a, on a weekend, <sighs> it opens on a Wednesday at 2 o'clock yes. in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but in 2007, it was somewhere in between where the, they were still showing a Friday night opening was midnight on Thursday, you know, yeah. or 11 midnight, I guess, midnight on Friday. And yeah. then shows began, you know, ran from then forward. So I waited, I saw it at a midnight showing on that, uh, you know, Friday. Wow. I was there Thursday late waiting for my right. seat and all that thing. You were eager. I uh, dragged my poor <laughs> wife uh, out to see it, you know, and much like we've talked about in New Jersey, I was expecting that they would have to wait in line for two hours and get the right seat and fight with somebody, some asshole who moved my jacket, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. None of it. It was like, <laughs> it was easy breezy, whatever. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, um, I almost fell asleep during it. Oh, um, well, it was midnight. It, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I it really would keep you awake if you were into it though. Yeah. I mean, waited for <laughs> so long for that. Yeah. yeah but the yeah. things, uh, so I was, my, 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 my opinion about it hasn't changed. It has okay. always been feeling like it's not canonical because of mm -hmm. the sort of genre breaking elements of it mm -hmm. for me at least. Mm -hmm. But also the thing that struck me, which was sort of objectively in a sense, I guess, because it, and it couldn't be avoided and maybe, but for this, I'd be a little more forgiving is so much of it seemed like it was filmed on a studio filmed mm -hmm. in a studio or in mm -hmm. front of a green screen. Okay. And what mm -hmm. I love about the first Indiana Jones, which I just rewatched and even Temple, although you know they had to be using studios certainly often is, whatever was supposed to be outside looked really like it was outside. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. And they really did crazy shit. I mean, you think about that yeah. first movie is so great because uh, Terry, mm -hmm. I can't remember his name. Uh, I think it was his double, that was his double in that film. The tr there was a couple of doubles that did these stuff. Going off the truck, being dragged, you know, mm -hmm. they did uh -huh. all of that stuff in camera. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. yep. Cut to mm -hmm. Crystal Skull. You know, Spielberg's made Jurassic Park already. He can make dinosaurs look real. Mm -hmm. But there was so much of it that looked fake that, so that was part of it. And also some of the sequences mm -hmm. were just so over the top. Shia LaBeouf somehow monkeys want to help him. It's that woman, you know, yeah. the ca yeah. female character yeah. from the yeah. other film. Monkeys are going to help him fight the Russians? What the f Yeah. So that kind of shit bugged me when I saw it then. And yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same level of ire for it. But- Mm -hmm. To your second part of your question, John, I've tried to rewatch it a number of times. I get to a certain point and I always stop. And oh, okay. the beginning of the film, I don't know, it's like the first 25 minutes maybe, again, seemed very practical. The opening with the Russia in that warehouse. Seems like a real warehouse. There's really a guy swinging on a rope, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> all that stuff <laughs> right. seems real. Yeah. Yeah. The chase scene through the school. Oh, the diner fight leading to the chase on the motorcycle. That all feels fantastic. There's a yeah, couple of yeah. times you're like, that's not Harrison Ford. That's like a 25 year old guy with sure. a white hair wig on. Right. <laughs> that was a little buggy, but again, yeah, it felt yeah. so much like the original film. Once they start going into the jungles and stuff, it felt yeah, nutty. But you know what's mm -hmm. crazy is I just saw like a few days ago is a lot of that shit. They really filmed in Hawaii. Some of those what? crazy ass really? truck stunts when they're fighting with swords on two different cars. 
which right. I was convinced was in a studio. They really shot that. So but they, they really shot it, but it looks crappy. Well, they wind up enhancing <laughs> it. And the, the, the oh. a big problem for me is the, this is, look, this is so wonky. The color grading of it is unlike any other Indiana Jones film. I think mm-hmm. it's probably the first Indiana Jones film that wasn't filmed or wasn't shot on film. It was all digital because you got digital. George Lucas always uses digital now. Mm. So all those things to me, again, I say that's objective in a sense, because I guess what I'm really mean is like almost sub- subconsciously. Those yeah, things yeah. are objectively true. They really did all those things. It's subconsciously, mm-hmm. just, there's no way of me avoiding my distaste mm-hmm. for it because of those things. Mm-hmm. If it was shot on film, if they did more practical stuff, I, I probably would have got away with some of those crazy sequences. I might even have been willing to accept UFOs at that point. <laughs> mm. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to rewatch it shortly. So yeah. I was really curious to know where you guys stood because yeah. I'm, I, I'm eager to see if my opinion changes having not seen it in now. Yeah. You know, 15 years. So I'm curious too. Yeah. We, we are going to do a rewatching before June. Oh, yeah. When is it? When does it come oh, out? Yeah. We, you have time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah imagine they're going to, they're going to, much like they dealt with Temple of Doom uh, in Raiders, which was a, you know, pre- Temple of Doom is a prequel technically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it was a prequel because, um, Spielberg wanted to, didn't want to have Nazis in it again. So he's like, well, mm. let's just set it before the time of the Nazis. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, the, you don't hear anything about any of the films. You know, each film sort of just stands independently. I wouldn't yeah, su- yeah. be surprised if there's some homages in this one, but for the most part, you don't have to have seen, certainly not have seen Crystal Skull. Probably sure. don't even have to have seen Temple of Doom. <laughs> probably, that's, probably no right. homages to that either. Right. No, not from a, any kind of a storyline thing, just for fun. You know, okay. just to like, yeah. okay, you know, get no, warmed just, up. Just a little callback, fan service. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, just to yeah. get juiced up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I've seen those films so many times, but Crystal Skull, like mm-hmm. I said, I get to that one point and I just mm. I check out. All right. Um, all right. Hey, well, thanks for humoring me. That was my curiosity. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's our show. Oh. Right. So good night, guys. Oh, shit. She's scrambling. <laughs> you need to put it on your screen, I think. I, I have occasionally done that. I even thought about it when we first started. <laughs> but she chose yeah. not to do it as per yes. the norm. Right. It's Here's like, another feature I <laughs> contemplated and then rejected <laughs> summarily. Things Kat would have, might have done to make the show better, but decided but against. chose against. <laughs> yes. Actually, I did run across something, not this. <laughs> yeah. You know how we were talking last week about um, a, a song, Pickles. rewriting a Christmas song oh, about right. the podcast. Yes. And oh, so, yes. Uh, so... So the other day uh, I heard a particular Christmas song that is controversial because I think it was last year. There was some controversy mm-hmm. around it, you know, hmm. um, and uh, you, you'll know it when I tell you in a moment. But I was like okay. sort of humming along and, and then I found myself singing along a little bit and I found myself saying, hey, baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I the, thought, oh no. Record skip? What was that? She's, just, she's shivering. She's acting it out. <laughs> the baby is cold. 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 So I thought, <laughs> that could make this more controversial. I don't think I should do that. Mm. <laughs> or oddly, maybe less. Maybe less. Baby, There's potential for less. Yeah. Baby's <laughs> cuckold is outside. Yeah. <laughs> Then it sounds like I believe, deleted- I believe that might shift the power dynamic of baby. It's cold outside. Yes, it could actually. But to yeah. whom? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You're right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Not to the cuckold. Um, but <laughs> he doesn't want the power. Yeah. This is kind of a, now a mashup of uh, what were we talking about? Uh, mommy is kissing Santa Claus. I saw mommy. I watched mommy kissing Santa Claus. <laughs> I looked right in her eyes yeah. the whole time. <laughs> but that's still the show. Hey, our show is yeah. brought to you every week, thanks in part to our early adopters like Kathy Burke, Rick mm-hmm. Parker, and Karen Flieger. Yeah. And mm-hmm. thank you especially to our secret of our success level Patreon supporters, mm-hmm. John Henderson, Craig Coletta, Marcus Taylor, and Tony Great. Great. Hey, and I want to let everybody know that Mark is special thanks, I suppose. Even more special thanks. Specialist or Specialer. things to Marcus uh, Taylor for he, increasing his commitment to, to uh, I almost said Jenix grown up to our show. <laughs> well, <laughs> that means the world to us. We're not doing anything differently. We're here just continuing to produce high quality content of the same we high quality. Raise. It's not higher quality, but Marcus has to uh, in uh, increase his investment, and in, uh, we certainly are super grateful for that. He is a notoriously generous fellow. Maybe he's trying to encourage us to do better. 
<laughs> just, may, these- maybe this will help. <laughs> he slides it across the table. Mm. You know I where did, to use this money. He did have a note that said, uh, stop talking about pickles. Speaking of that, actually, look, there's plenty of ways you can support the show, including just send us a message, uh, make a post on Facebook, email me at will at 1980s. Now, any way that just helps get the word out or lift our spirits even. And uh, I've got some examples for you here uh, Mm -hmm. regarding our uh, episode last week where we did tell this this tale, this true tale of uh, 1984, how this a pole sitter. The story itself is boring, right? I mean, I, I, I... I don't know how we got a lot Our of Our telling it. of it, however, yeah, yeah, was yeah. far from boring. The story was normal. The storytelling went off the rails. So Brad wrote on Facebook, John conjured some brilliantly odd imagery for me. <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, I said it too. Every time I yep. listened to that show, editing it, uh, every time I got to that part, <laughs> pickles were piling up here. Oh, can't uh, Miss So uh, on uh, YouTube uh, commented, I've listened to this like four times in the past couple of days and I can't stop laughing. Uh, I love that because yeah. I can't stop laughing when yeah. I listen. So I'm glad Jack it happens it. to somebody else too. Um, Jackie, our, our friend over at uh, The Beat Goes On, uh, mm-hmm. Dating After Divorce wrote, Yep. I don't want to eat pickles ever again. <laughs> <laughs> or corn. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. wow. She was really listening oh. closely there. She well, was. She's been paying right. attention. Uh, Absolutely. Well, to count yourself lucky, I didn't ruin peanuts for you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no. I don't know how he would, but I don't want to know. Or the coleslaw. Um, and also, so and regarding our, this is a different episode, regarding our, uh, I meant to share this to you guys already, but I forgot. Um, uh, regarding our, mm-hmm. what do we call it? Uh, quirkiest Christmas songs, which you can still listen to. It's still the Christmas season. Yeah. Uh, and on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, they actually, YouTube included the links to the songs if you want to hear them. And on Spotify, we have a special, what's it called? Story. Not Spotify. Oh, that's, that's on Pandora. Johnson. On yeah, Pandora, yeah. we have a special <laughs> story uh, where mm-hmm. you can actually mm-hmm. hear the songs uh, inter, inter, interjected, injected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Into you, into your <laughs> mail merged into the podcast. Anyway, but uh, regarding that episode, Ooh. Keith wrote us uh, saying, sent us an email saying, you guys missed one of the most obscure, depressing Christmas songs oh. of the eighties in your current episode uh, mm. or in your, in that Christmas episode, Prince's yeah. another lonely Christmas. Oh, and he gave us the lyric featuring the lyric. My mama used to say, always trust your lover. Now I guess that only applies to her because baby, you promised me. Baby, you promised me you'd never leave. Then you died on the 25th day of December. Oh. oh. Yeah, we did miss that, Keith. Wow. Whoa. Holy wow. cow. How dare you die? I have a comment here yeah. from our friend Craig Anderson. Oh, yeah. After he listened, um, yeah. he gave advice to absolutely start watching Doctor Who from the ninth Doctor's Run, which okay. starts in 2005. Mm. Uh, He says, it is kind of bonkers in parts. And there are times when you might say, why the hell am I still watching this? (laughs) But then it will hit you out of left field with an episode that will make you cry. Oh, wow. Capital letters. I'm looking at you, season five, episode 10. (laughs) So very specific. specific. Yes. And also when you get to season three, episode 10, blink. Make absolutely sure you have a warm blankie and a stuffed animal for protection. Oh, Shudder. Blink is phenomenal. That oh. is one that I've seen multiple times. Okay. You don't have to know what Doctor Who is. That's just a great standalone story. So huh. I'll vouch for that. Right. So you saying Blink? I thought it was instructions, and it had me thinking about like a Weeping Angels, maybe. That's what it is. Oh, oh it is. Okay. It is. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, yep. sure. Thanks. I certainly do appreciate it. Like I said, I wish I could have been watching it. Why not? Not since the beginning. <laughs> we were, <laughs> and I'm not going to catch up. But maybe that's a good jumping uh, in point. Talk about pressure, mm-hmm. man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pressure that we feel every week on this show, and we will feel it again next week because uh, we will talk to you again then uh, next time on 1980s Now. Until next time. <laughs> bye bye. This podcast is part of the 80s Ruled Network. Visit the 80s Ruled on Facebook for more 1980s awesomeness.